Oh, what's up fellow nerds? I am your host, Dr. McKay, and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is my first video of 2026, and I want to begin this year's content with a simple comparison breakdown of the differences between Star Trek's Warp Drive and Stargate's Hyperdrive. And yes, I know they are completely different technologies, so this video is not a who's got the better drive video, it's more to compare the two drives and show the differences on what makes them unique. So with that said, in this breakdown I will give a brief overview of each of the faster than light technologies <clears throat> from each universe and then go into specifics and finish off with a brief comparison of them. But before we get started, if you like the content, please feel free to like, comment and subscribe for more. And with that said, uh, let's go. So to begin, let's dive into warp drive from Star Trek. So, warp drive is the primary method of faster than light travel within Star Trek. And in this universe, is, la la la. In this universe, many species achieve warp drive on their own through their own technological development being a prerequisite for first contact by the United Federations of Planets. Warp drive enables faster than light travel by creating a warp bubble around the ship, allowing for the contracting of space in front of the ship and expanding it behind, allowing the ship to essentially surf the fabric of space-time without breaking the laws of relativity, while also preventing time dilation. And though the warp bubble separates the ship from space-time, the ship still remains a solid object within space-time, meaning the ship has to avoid stars and planets and other space phenomena while travelling at warp speeds, meaning the ship has to navigate these obstacles or collide with them, making warp drive somewhat dangerous. This method of travel has many speeds, and to help me out I have found this warp speed chart showing the next generation's warp speed index. So let's go over some of these speeds starting with warp 1. So warp 1's speed is essentially the speed of light, which is 1.8 billion, so that's with a B, billion, kilometers an hour, or 300,000 kilometers a second. And at this speed, it would take 5 years to travel to the nearest star system from Earth, or 100,000 years to travel the length of the Milky Way galaxy itself. But that's just warp 1. Let's up the speed to warp 5, which is the standard cruising speed of Federation starships. So, the speed of warp 5 is 214 times the speed of light. That's a darn sight faster than warp 1. However, space is vast. But still, with warp 5, it reduces the time to the nearest star from 5 years to 9 days, a lot more comfortable for space travel. Now yes, that is a lot faster than Warp 1, but across the galaxy it would still take 467 years, and that's not within the human lifespan, so Warp 5 is more for local travel in your galaxy's star neighbourhood. Okay, so let's make the jump to Warp 9.9. Nine. Well, this speed is hard to achieve with only a few starships designed to go this fast. But how fast is Warp 9.9? .9? Well, it's just over 3,000 times the speed of light and takes a whopping 14 hours to reach the nearest star system from Earth and around 33 years to travel the length of the Milky Way galaxy, making that journey more realistic for human lifespans. However, to go this speed in Star Trek requires immense power and can only be held for around 12 hours before extreme damage is done to the engines. So with this problem, it makes long duration flight at these speeds unobtainable due to technological stress, making the journey substantially longer. But if we was to remove the limits and push the engines to say warp 9.9999, nine, well, that's almost 200,000 times the speed of light and would take around six months to travel the length of the galaxy. Now that's pretty damn fast. However, this speed is not for starships, but for the communication subspace relays we see in Trek. So we can only imagine starships doing that speed in the show. 
Moving on, the last speed I want to cover is warp 10. Now warp 10 is a completely unique speed, as it's not a speed in velocity, and to call and to even call it a speed wouldn't work either. Let me explain. In theory, warp 10 is infinite, meaning in theory, at warp 10, you would occupy all points in the universe simultaneously and be everywhere at once. And though it's theoretically unobtainable, it has been achieved once in Star Trek Voyager. Now, for the sake of this video, we won't count warp 10 as an achievable speed for this comparison, but it is fun to try and wrap your head around being everywhere all at once. So with the warps 1, 5 and 9.9 .9 covered as our points of speed, let's jump universes and try and break down the Stargate's hyperdrive. <clears throat> Right, up next, the Stargate's hyperdrive. So, in Stargate, the standard faster than light travel is vastly different than Star Trek's warp drive. So in Stargate, hyperdrive is a technology developed by several species within the universe, with some notable inventors being the Ancients and the Asgard, with other species only adopting the aforementioned technology. So, for the premise of this coverage, I will cover the Asgard's own hyperdrive, the Tauri's Asgard's hand-me-down hyperdrive, and the Gold's hyperdrive, derived from ancient technology. So, how does hyperspace work? Well, unlike warp drive that moves space around the ship to get around the whole relativity issue, Hyperspace does something different. Hyperspace uses a separate dimension outside of normal space time. This is called subspace. This dimension of subspace does not have the relativity issue to worry about. So in Stargate, once you have acquired the technology and the required power generation for said technology, all you have to do is open a doorway into hyperspace. This is called opening a hyperspace window. Once a stable window is open, the ship then propels itself into the window and into subspace, with the window closing behind them. The ship then uses its sublight engines to travel in a type of subspace tunnel in a straight line to its destination. This is because subspace is separate from normal space time and allows for ships traveling in hyperspace to pass straight through stellar objects. This perk allows for direct travel through space and cuts travel time down by not having to navigate hazards in space. Ships traveling in hyperspace can stay in hyperspace basically indefinitely, as long as it can protect itself from subspace radiation and the engines continue to function normally. There seems to be no limit for the duration you can be in subspace, but there are exceptions like with the Wraith having to drop out of hyperspace to allow their ship's hulls to regenerate from the radiation caused by the subspace field. But speaking of dropping out, how does one exit hyperspace? Well, it's the same way as entering. One simply opens an exit hyperspace window at your destination and exits subspace to normal space. So from a cosmic outside observer, the ship essentially disappears in one location and emerges light years away in another after its traveled time. So now we have covered how it works, let's move to the speed and time for travel, or should I say try, as you are all aware that Stargate doesn't really keep technical specifications for its advanced technology and is mostly comprised of on-screen calculations and assumptions with the plot dictating overall speed. But what I have found should be enough for this breakdown. So let's dive in. Firstly, let's cover the Asgard's own engines on the O'Neill class. Now, all this information is not confirmed, but is calculated on on-screen visuals and are subject to change, so bear that in mind. So the Asgard's O'Neill is the fastest on-screen ship we ever see, seen going clear across the galaxy in seconds to minutes, and from the Ida galaxy to the Milky Way galaxy in hours, possibly even in a single day. And given that the Ida galaxy is 4 million light years away in distance, that's incredibly fast. So let's try and science the hell out of this, shall we? So for our calculations, we are using 24 hours as the time traveled and 4 million light years as the distance of travel. And we get 
Huh. Oh my. We get 1.461 billion times the speed of light. That is insanely fast. And if my math is right, and please do check me on that, that's 487,000 times faster than Warp 9.9. Dang. Okay, the Asgard are crazy, but let's just move on to something more sensible, shall we, with the Daedalus. So firstly, the Daedalus uses a hand-me-down Asgard engine, making it already incredible, but it's not the Asgard's most advanced tech, so it is far slower than what we see them use on the O'Neill. But how much slower? Well, let's find out. So we will do two calculations for the Daedalus here. One with a ZPM and one without a ZPM. Our journey's distance will be to the Pegasus galaxy being 3 million... Being 3 million light years in travel distance with our travel time having two durations. The first is with the ZPM making the journey time around four days, making the Daedalus's speed being 274 million times the speed of light, being five times slower than the Asgard's O'Neill. However, this is with the ancient ZPM. So let's count clear again, but this time without, <clears throat> without a ZPM. And without a ZPM, the Daedalus's travel time takes around 18 days to complete, making the speed of the Daedalus around 61 million times the speed of light, which is still incredibly fast, only taking 14 hours to fly clear across the Milky Way galaxy itself, giving the Tauri the ability to travel anywhere in the Milky Way galaxy or within other galaxies of the, the same size, only about one day of travel. And compared to Star Trek, that's vastly different. Now, I have only covered the Asgard and the Daedalus's hyperdrives here, so let me just throw in the Gold's hyperdrive here to show you the universe's lower tech speeds. So the Gold's hyperdrive is vastly inferior to the Asgard's, but it can still reach speeds of up to 32,000 times the speed of light, allowing for galaxy travel of around three years. This is around 2,000 times slower than the Daedalus, but still 10 times faster than that of Warp 9.9, .9, and still allows for galaxy-wide travel in good times, compared to that of Star Trek. And given all we have calculated here, Stargate's hyperdrives, regardless of whose, are far superior to that of Star Trek's warp drive. But remember, this video is not a contest between who's got the best drive. In this next segment, I want to talk about the differences of the two drives and just have a talk about my thoughts, so let's discuss. So I know that we are talking about two very different universes here, and they both have their very own unique technologies, but I do want to point out that to compare both drives is unfair, as they both use vastly different methods of travel, but I still want to showcase their differences that I have covered, so I stress this is not a contest. Right. To begin, let's talk about the methods of travel. So Star Trek's warp drive warps space around their ships, while Stargate's hyperdrive uses a separate dimension for travel. Both methods get around the issue of relativity and the time dilation effects caused at those speeds. But that's the only common thing between them. Star Trek has to navigate space to avoid stars, planets, and other space stuffs, while Stargate flies in a straight line, passing through stellar bodies with no harm to the ship. And the last difference I want to talk about is the speed. Star Trek speed is only thousands of times faster than light, whereas Stargate's is millions of times faster. Now, it's unclear in Star Trek if warp drive can exceed warp 9.9 .9 or the official max starship speed of warp 9.975 without entering warp 10. And I know we do have other FTL travel methods in Star Trek which do exceed warp 9.9 .9 speed with methods like transwarp, quantum slipstream drive, spore drive, coaxial warp, drive, subspace vortex, which is kind of like hyperspace, wormholes, 
Graviton Catapult, and even a Soliton Wave. And I could even include the Temporal Drive as well, and whatever the Iconian Doorways do. And while these are all faster than Warp 9.9, .9, my point is, Star Trek is a few centuries ahead of us, and with many races and technologies at hand, why does it still take forever to travel across, across the galaxy compared to that of Stargate? where Deadless can go basically anywhere in the Milky Way in around a day, if needed. And now I know the Tauri didn't invent their hyperdrive as like the humans did in Star Trek for the warp drive, you know, as the hyperdrive was gifted to the Tauri by the Asgard, and the Asgard are far beyond Star Trek in level of technology. And if we do include the story and plot purposes, you know, Star Trek explores space. So going fast, so going places fast is not the point of Star Trek, while Stargate is not like that, but I still struggle to understand why Star Trek doesn't push for these alternatives, for emergencies or direct travel as a standard. Now, I know with the new Star Trek shows that is set after Voyager in the timeline, we do have other drives that are used that are faster than Warp 9.9, .9, but they are still slower than Stargate, except maybe the Spore Drive and like wormholes and the Iconian Doorway that is like instant teleportation. Um, but I just can't help myself and compare them, you know? It's just what I do. But yeah, these are my thoughts and I thought I would share them with you as I find this topic very interesting and I would love to discuss more in the comments below with you all. Um, Stargate's hyperdrive speeds compared to Star Trek's warp speeds should never be compared for a contest. But, you know, if I could pick one for my imaginary starship, I would pick the Stargate's hyperdrive every time. But what would you choose? Well, there we go, my fellow nerds. This concludes today's video on Star Trek's warp drive and Stargate's hyperdrive and the differences between them. I did my best to find information on Stargate's hyperdrives, speeds and such, but there is no tech manual for Stargate like there is for Star Trek. So all the calculations in this video have been from on-screen visuals and the information I have found online from Canon sources. And I hope my math is right, but please do check if you want and if you do like the content please feel free to like comment and subscribe for more i have been your host dr mckay thank you all for watching and until the next video i'll catch you all then cheers and goodbye and have a good rest of your day bye